Track Three, The Woman in White. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins, read by Tim Bulkley, of BigBible.org. Track Three, The First Epoch, Eight. When I entered the room I found Miss Halcombe and an elderly lady seated at the luncheon table. The elderly lady, when I was presented to her, proved to be Miss Fairley's former governess, Mrs. Vasey, who had been briefly described to me by my lively companion at the breakfast table, as possessed of all the cardinal virtues and counting for nothing. I can do little more than offer my humble testimony to the truthfulness of Miss Halcombe's sketch of the old lady's character. Mrs. Vasey, looked the personification of human composure and female amiability. A calm enjoyment of a calm existence beamed in drowsy smiles on her plump, placid face. Some of us rush through life, and some of us saunter through life. Mrs. Vasey sat through life, sat in the house early and late, sat in the garden, sat in unexpected window-seats in passages, sat on a camp-stool when her friends tried to take her out walking sat before she looked at anything, before she talked of anything, before she answered yes or no to the commonest question, always with the same serene smile on her lips, the same vacantly attentive turn of the head, the same snugly comfortable position of her hands and arms, under every possible change of domestic circumstances, a mild, a compliant, an unutterably tranquil and harmless old lady, who never by any chance suggested the idea that she had been actually active since the hour of her birth. Nature has much to do in this world, and is engaged in generating such a vast variety of coexistent productions, that she must surely be now and then too flurried and confused to distinguish between the different processes that she is carrying on at the same time. Starting from this point of view, it will always remain my private persuasion that nature was absorbed in making cabbages when Mrs. Vasey was born, and that the good lady, suffered the consequences of a vegetable preoccupation in the mind of the mother of us all. "'Now, Mrs. Vasey,' said Miss Halcombe, looking brighter, sharper, and readier than ever, by contrast with the undemonstrative old lady at her side. "'What will you have? A cutlet?' Mrs. Vasey crossed her dimpled hands on the edge of the table, smiled placidly, and said, "'Yes, dear.' "'What is that opposite Mr. Hartwright? Boiled chicken, is it not?' I thought you liked boiled chicken better than cutlet, Mrs. Vasey. Mrs. Vasey took her dimpled hands off the edge of the table and crossed them on her lap instead, nodded contemplatively at the boiled chicken, and said, Yes, dear. Well, but which will you have to-day? Shall Mr. Hartwright give you some chicken, or shall I give you some cutlet? Mrs. Vasey put one of her dimpled hands back again on the edge of the table, hesitated drowsily, and said, Which you please, dear? Mercy me, it's a question of your taste, my good lady, not for mine. Suppose you have a little of both. Suppose you begin with the chicken, because Mr. Hartwright looks devoured by anxiety to carve for you. Mrs. Vasey put the other dimpled hand back on the edge of the table, brightened dimly one moment, went out again the next, bowed obediently, and said, If you please, sir. Surely a mild, compliant, and an utterably tranquil and harmless old lady but enough, perhaps, for the present of Mrs. Vasey. All this time there were no signs of Miss Fairley. We finished our luncheon, and still she never appeared. Miss Halcombe, whose quick eye nothing escaped, noticed the looks that I cast from time to time in the direction of the door. "'I understand you, Mr. Hartwright,' she said. "'You're wondering what's become of your other pupil. She's been downstairs, and has got over her headache, but has not sufficiently recovered her appetite to join us at lunch.' If you'll put yourself under my charge, I think I can undertake to find her somewhere in the garden." She took up a parasol lying on a chair near me, and led the way out, by a long window at the bottom of the room which opened on the lawn. It's almost unnecessary to say that we left Mrs. Vasey, still seated at the table, with her dimpled hands still crossed on the edge of it, apparently settled in that position for the rest of the afternoon. As we crossed the lawn, Miss Halcombe looked at me significantly, and shook her head. "'That mysterious adventure of yours,' she said, "'still remains involved in its own appropriate midnight darkness. 
I've been all morning looking over my mother's letters, and have made no discoveries yet. However, don't despair, Mr. Hartwright. This is a matter of curiosity, and you have got a woman for your ally. Under such conditions success is certain sooner or later. The letters are not exhausted. I have three packets still left, and you may confidently rely on my spending the whole evening over them. Here, then, was one of my anticipations of the morning still unfulfilled. I began to wonder next whether my introduction to Miss Fairley would disappoint the expectations that I had been forming of her since breakfast-time. "'And how did you get on with Mr. Fairley?' inquired Miss Halcombe, as we left the lawn and turned into a shrubbery. "'Was he particularly nervous this morning? Never mind considering about your answer, Mr. Hartwright. The mere fact of your being obliged to consider is enough for me. I see in your face that he was particularly nervous, and I am amiably unwilling to throw you into the same condition. I ask no more.' We turned off into a winding path while she was speaking, and approached a pretty summer-house built of wood, in the form of a miniature Swiss chalet. The one room of the summer-house, as we ascended the steps to the door, was occupied by a young lady. She was standing near a rustic table, looking out at the inland view of moor and hill presented by a gap in the trees, and absently turning over the leaves of a little sketch-book that lay at her side. This was Miss Fairley. How can I describe her? How can I separate her from my own sensations, and from all that has happened in the later time? How can I see her again as she looked when my eyes first rested on her, as she should look now to the eyes that are about to see her in these pages? The watercolour drawing that I made of Laura Fairley at an after-period, in the place and the attitude in which I first saw her, lies on my desk as I write. I look at it, and there dawns upon me brightly, from the dark greenish-brown background of the summer-house, a light youthful figure, clothed in a simple muslin dress, the pattern of it formed by broad alternate stripes of delicate blue and white. A scarf of the same material sits crisply and closely round her shoulders, and a little straw hat of a natural colour, plainly and sparingly trimmed with ribbon to match the gown, covers her head and throws its soft, pearly shadow over the upper part of her face. Her hair is of so faint and paler brown, not flaxen, and yet almost as light, not golden, and yet almost as glossy, that it nearly melts here and there into the shadow of the hat. It is plainly parted, and then drawn back over her ears, and the line of it ripples naturally as it crosses her forehead. The eyebrows are rather darker than the hair, and the eyes are of that soft, limpid, turquoise blue, so often sung by poets, and so seldom seen in real life. Lovely eyes in colour, lovely eyes in form, large and tender and quietly thoughtful, but beautiful above all things, in the clear truthfulness of the look that dwells in their inmost depths, and shines through all their changes of expression, with the light of a purer and a better world. The charm, most gently and yet most distinctly expressed, which they shed over the whole face, so covers and transforms its little natural human blemishes elsewhere, that it is difficult to estimate the relative merits and defects of the other features. It's hard to see that the lower part of the face is too delicately refined away towards the chin to be in full and fair proportion with the upper part, that the nose, in escaping the aquiline bend, always hard and cruel in a woman, no matter how abstractedly perfect it may be, has erred little in the other extreme, and has missed the ideal straightness of line, and that the sweet, sensitive lips are subject to a slight nervous contraction when she smiles, which draws them upwards a little at one corner towards the cheek. It might be possible to note these blemishes in another woman's face, but it is not easy to dwell on them in hers, so subtly are they connected with all that is individual and characteristic in her expression, and so closely does the expression depend for its full play and life with every other feature on the moving impulse of the eyes. Does my poor portrait of her, my fond, patient labour of long and happy days, show me these things? Ah, how few of them there are in the dim mechanical drawing, and how many in the mind with which I regard it! A fair, delicate girl, in a pretty light dress, trifling with the leaves of a sketch-book, while she looks up from it with truthful, innocent blue eyes. That's all the drawing can say. 
all perhaps that even the deeper reach of thought and pen can say in their language either the woman who first gives life light and form to our shadowy conceptions of beauty fill a void in our spiritual nature that has remained unknown to us till she appeared sympathies that lie too deep for words too deep almost for thoughts are touched at such times by other charms than those which the senses feel and which the resource of expression can realize the mystery which underlies the beauty of a woman is never raised above the reach of all expression until it is claimed kindred with the deeper mystery of our own souls then and then only has it passed beyond the narrow region on which light falls in this world from the pencil and the pen think of her as you thought of the first woman who quickened the pulses within you that the rest of her sex had no art to stir let the kind candid blue eyes meet yours as they met mine with the matchless look which we both remember so well let her voice speak the music that you once loved best attuned as sweetly to your ear as to mine let her footstep as she comes and goes in these pages be like that other footstep to whose airy fall your own heart once beat time take her as the visionary nursling of your own fancy and she will grow upon you all the more clearly as the living woman who dwells in mine among the sensations that crowded on me when my eyes first looked upon her familiar sensations which we all know which spring to life in most of our hearts die away again in so many and renew their bright existence in so few there was one that troubled and perplexed me one that seemed strangely inconsistent and unaccountably out of place in miss fairley's presence mingling with the vivid impression produced by the charm of her fair face and head her sweet expression and her winning simplicity of manner was another impression which in a shadowy way suggested to me the idea of something wanting At one time it seemed like something wanting in her at another like something wanting in myself which hindered me from understanding her as i ought the impression was always strongest in the most contradictory manner when she looked at me or in other words when i was most conscious of the harmony and charm of her face and yet at the same time most troubled by the sense of incompleteness which it was impossible to discover something wanting something wanting and where it was and what it was i could not say the effect of this curious caprice of fancy as i thought it then was not of a nature to set me at my ease during the first interview with miss fairley the few kind words of welcome which she spoke found me hardly self-possessed enough to thank her in the customary phrases of reply observing my hesitation and no doubt attributing it naturally enough to some momentary shyness on my part miss halcombe took the business of talking as easily and readily as usual into her own hands look there mr hartright she said pointing to the sketch-book on the table and to the little delicate wandering hand that was still trifling with it surely you will acknowledge that your model pupil is found at last the moment she hears that you are in the house she seizes her inestimable sketch-book looks universal nature straight in the face and longs to begin miss fairley laughed with a ready good humour which broke out as brightly as if it had been part of the sunshine above us over her lovely face I must not take credit to myself where no credit is due she said her clear truthful blue eyes looking alternately at miss holcombe and me fond as i am of drawing i was so conscious of my own ignorance that i am more afraid than anxious to begin now that you're here mr hartright i find myself looking over my sketches as i used to look over my lessons when i was a little girl when i was sadly afraid that i should turn out not fit to be heard she made the confession very prettily and simply and with quaint childish earnestness drew the sketch-book away close to her own side of the table miss halcombe cut the knot of the little embarrassment forthwith in her resolute downright way good bad or indifferent she said the pupil's sketches must pass through the fiery ordeal of the master's judgment and there's an end of it suppose we take them with us in the carriage laura and let mr hartwright see them for the first time under circumstances of perpetual jolting and interruption if we can only confuse him all through the drive 
between nature as it is when he looks up at the view and nature as it is not when he looks down again at our sketch-books we shall drive him into the last desperate refuge of paying us compliments and shall slip through his professional fingers with our pet feathers of vanity all unruffled i hope mr hartright will pay me no compliments said miss fairley as we all left the summer-house may i venture to inquire why you express that hope i asked because i shall believe all that you say to me she answered simply in those few words she unconsciously gave me the key to her whole character to that generous trust in others which in her nature grew innocently out of the sense of her own truth i only knew it intuitively then i know it by experience now we merely waited to rouse good miss vasey from the place which she still occupied at the deserted luncheon table before we entered the open carriage for our promised drive the old lady and miss halcombe occupied the back seat miss fairley and i sat together in front with the sketch-book open between us fairly exhibited at last to my professional eyes all serious criticism of the drawings even if i had been disposed to volunteer it was rendered impossible by miss halcombe's lively resolution to see nothing but the ridiculous side of the fine arts as practised by herself her sister and ladies in general i can remember the conversation that passed far more easily than the sketches that i mechanically looked over that part of the talk especially in which miss fairley took any share is still as vividly impressed on my memory as if i had heard it only a few hours ago yes let me acknowledge that this first day i let the charm of her presence lure me from the recollection of myself and my position the most trifling of the questions that she put to me on the subject of using her pencil and mixing her colours the slightest alterations of expression in the lovely eyes that looked into mine with such earnest desire to learn all that i could teach and to discover all that i could show attracted more of my attention than the finest view we passed through or the grandest changes of light and shade as they flowed into each other over the waving moorland and level beach at any time and under any circumstances of human interest is it not strange to see how little real hold the objects of the natural world amid which we live can gain on our hearts and minds we go to nature for comfort in trouble and sympathy and joy only in books admiration of those beauties of the inanimate world which modern poetry so largely and so eloquently describes is not even in the best of us one of the original instincts of our nature as children we none of us possess it no uninstructed man or woman possesses it those whose lives are most exclusively passed amid the ever-changing wonders of sea and land are also those who are most universally insensible to every aspect of nature not directly associated with the human interest of their calling our capacity of appreciating the beauties of the earth we live on is in truth one of the civilized accomplishments which we all learn as an art and more that very capacity is rarely practised by any of us except when our minds are most indolent and most unoccupied how much share have the attractions of nature ever had in the pleasurable or painful interests and emotions of ourselves or our friends what space do they ever occupy in the thousand little narratives of personal experience which pass every day by word of mouth from one of us to the other all that our minds can compass all that our hearts can learn can be accomplished with equal certainty equal profit and equal satisfaction to ourselves in the poorest as in the richest prospect that the face of the earth can show there is surely a reason for this want of inborn sympathy between the creature and the creation around it a reason which may perhaps be found in the widely differing destinies of man and his earthly sphere the grandest mountain prospect that the eye can range over is appointed to annihilation the smallest human interest that the human heart can feel is appointed to immortality we've been out nearly three hours when the carriage again passed through the gates of limeridge house on our way back i had let the ladies settle for themselves the first point of view which they were to sketch under my instructions on the afternoon of the next day when they withdrew to dress for dinner and when i was alone again in my little sitting-room my spirits seemed to leave me all of a sudden i felt ill at ease and dissatisfied with myself i hardly knew why 
perhaps i was now conscious for the first time of having enjoyed our drive too much in the character of a guest and too little in the character of a drawing-master perhaps that strange sense of something wanting either in miss fairley or in myself which had perplexed me when i first was introduced to her haunted me still anyhow it was a relief to my spirits when the dinner hour called me out of my solitude and took me back to the society of the ladies of the house i was struck on entering the drawing-room by the curious contrast rather in material than in colour of the dresses which they now wore while mrs vesey and miss halcombe were richly clad each in the manner most becoming to her age the first in silver grey and the second in that delicate primrose yellow colour which matches so well with the dark complexion and black hair miss fairley was unpretendingly and almost poorly dressed in plain white muslin it was spotlessly pure it was beautifully put on but still it was the sort of dress which the wife or daughter of a poor man might have worn and it made her so far as externals went look less affluent in circumstances than her own governess at a later period when i learnt to know more of miss fairley's character i discovered that this curious contrast on the wrong side was due to her natural delicacy of feeling and natural intensity of aversion to the slightest personal display of her own wealth neither mrs vesey nor miss halcombe could ever induce her to let the advantage in dress desert the two ladies who were poor to lean to the side of the one lady who was rich when the dinner was over we returned together to the drawing-room although mr fairley emulating the magnificent condescension of the monarch who had picked up titian's brush for him had instructed his butler to consult my wishes in relation to the wine which I might prefer after dinner, I was resolute enough to resist the temptation of sitting in solitary grandeur among bottles of my own choosing, and sensible enough to ask the ladies' permission to leave the table with them habitually, on the civilised foreign plan, during the period of my residence at Limeridge House. The drawing-room, to which we had now withdrawn for the rest of the evening, was on the ground floor and was of the same shape and size as the breakfast-room. Large glass doors at the lower end opened onto the terrace, beautifully ornamented along its whole length with a profusion of flowers. The soft, hazy twilight was just shading leaf and blossom alike into harmony with its own sombre hues as we entered the room. And the sweet evening scent of the flowers met us with its fragrant welcome through the open glass doors. Good Mrs. Vesey, always the first of the party to sit down, took possession of an armchair in the corner, and dozed off comfortably to sleep. At my request, Miss Fairley placed herself at the piano. As I followed her to a seat near the instrument, I saw Miss Holcombe retire into a recess of one of the side windows, to proceed with a search through her mother's letters by the last rays of the evening light. How vividly that peaceful home picture of the drawing-room comes back to me while I write. From the place where I sat I could see Miss Holcombe's graceful figure, half of it in soft light, half in mysterious shadow, bending intently over the letters in her lap, while nearer to me the fair profile of the player at the piano was just delicately defined against the faintly deepening background of the inner wall of the room. Outside on the terrace, the clustering flowers and long grasses and creepers waved so gently in the light evening air that the sound of their rustling never reached us. The sky was without a cloud, and the dawning mystery of moonlight began to tremble already in the region of the eastern heaven. The sense of peace and seclusion soothed all thought and feeling into a rapt, unearthly repose, and the balmy quiet that deepened ever with the deepening light, seemed to hover over us in a gentler influence still, when there stole upon it from the piano the heavenly tenderness of the music of Mozart. It was an evening of sights and sounds never to forget. We all sat silent in the places we'd chosen, Mrs. Vesey still sleeping, Miss Fairley still playing, Miss Halcombe still reading, till the light failed us. By this time the moon had stolen round to the terrace, and soft, mysterious rays of light were slanting already across the lower end of the room. The change from the twilight obscurity was so beautiful that we banished the lamps by common consent, 
when the servant brought them in, and kept the large room unlighted, except by the glimmer of the two candles at the piano. For half an hour more the music still went on. After that the beauty of the moonlight view on the terrace tempted Miss Fairley out to look at it, and I followed her. When the candles at the piano had been lighted, Miss Halcombe had changed her place so as to continue her examination of the letters with their assistance. We left her on a low chair at one side of the instrument, so absorbed over her reading that she did not seem to notice when we moved. We had been out on the terrace together, just in front of the glass doors, hardly so long as five minutes, I should think, and Miss Fairley was, by my advice, just tying her white handkerchief over her head as a precaution against the night air, when I heard Miss Halcombe's voice, low, eager, and altered from its natural lively tone, pronounce my name. "'Mr. Hartwright,' she said, "'will you come here for a minute? I want to speak to you.' I entered the room immediately. The piano stood about halfway down along the inner wall. On the side of the instrument furthest from the terrace, Miss Halcombe was sitting with the letters scattered on her lap, and with one hand she selected from them, and held close to the candle. On the side nearest to the terrace there stood a low ottoman, on which I took my place. In this position I was not far from the glass doors, and I could see Miss Fairley plainly, as she passed and repassed the opening on the terrace, walking slowly from end to end of it in the full radiance of the moon. I, I want you to listen while I read the concluding passages in this letter, said Miss Halcombe. Tell me if you think they throw any light upon your strange adventure on the road to London. The letter is addressed by my mother to her second husband, Mr. Fairley, and the date refers to a period between eleven and twelve years since. At that time Mr. and Mrs. Fairley and my half-sister Laura had been living for years in this house. I was away from them, completing my education at a school in Paris." She looked and spoke earnestly, and as I thought, a little uneasily as well. At the moment when she raised the letter to the candle before beginning to read it, Miss Fairley passed us on the terrace, looked in for a moment, and seeing that we were engaged, slowly walked on. Miss Halcombe began to read as follows. You will be tired, my dear Philip, of hearing perpetually about my schools and my scholars. Lay the blame, pray, on the dull uniformity of life at Limeridge, and not on me. Besides, this time I have something really interesting to tell you about a new scholar. You know old Mrs. Kemp at the village shop? Well, after years of ailing, the doctor has at last given her up, and she's dying slowly, day by day. Her only living relation, a sister, arrived last week to take care of her. This sister comes all the way from Hampshire. Her name is Mrs. Catherick. Four days ago Mrs. Catherick came here to see me, and brought her only child with her, a sweet little girl about a year older than our darling Laura. As the last sentence fell from the reader's lips, Miss Fairley passed us on the terrace once more. She was softly singing to herself one of the melodies which she had been playing earlier in the evening. Miss Halcombe waited until she had passed out of sight again, and then went on with the letter. Mrs. Catherick is a decent, well-behaved, respectable woman, middle-aged, and with the remains of having been moderately, only moderately, nice-looking. There is something in her manner and her appearance, however, which I can't make out. She is reserved about herself to the point of downright secrecy, and there is a look in her face, I can't describe it, which suggests to me that she has something on her mind. She is altogether what you would call a walking mystery. Her errand at Limeridge House, however, was simple enough. When she left Hampshire to nurse her sister, Mrs. Kemp, through her last illness, she had been obliged to bring her daughter with her, through having no one at home to take care of the little girl. Mrs. Kemp may die in a week's time, or may linger on for months, and Mrs. Catherick's object was to ask me to let her daughter, Anne, have the benefit of attending my school, subject to the condition of her being removed from it to go home again with her mother after Mrs. Kemp's death. I consented at once, and when Laura and I went out for our walk, we took the little girl, who is just eleven years old, to the school that very day. Once more Miss Fairley's figure, bright and soft in its snowy muslin dress, her face prettily framed by the white folds of the handkerchief which she had tied under her chin, passed by us in the moonlight. Once more Miss Halcombe waited 
till she was out of sight, and then went on. I have taken a violent fancy, Philip, to my new scholar, for a reason which I mean to keep to the last for the sake of surprising you. Her mother having told me as little about the child as she told me about herself, I was left to discover, which I did on the very first day when we tried her at lessons, that the poor little thing's intellect is not developed as it ought to be at her age. Seeing this, I had her up at the house the next day, and privately arranged with the doctor to come and watch her and question her, and tell me what he thought. His opinion is that she will grow out of it. But he says her careful bringing up at school is a matter of great importance just now, because her unusual slowness in acquiring ideas implies an unusual tenacity in keeping them when they are once received into her mind. Now, my love, you must not imagine in your off-hand way that I have been attaching myself to an idiot. This poor little Anne Catherick is a sweet, affectionate, grateful girl, and says the quaintest, prettiest things, as you shall judge by an instance, in the most oddly sudden, surprised, half-frightened way. Although she is dressed very neatly, her clothes show a sad want of taste in colour and pattern. So I arranged yesterday that some of our darling Laura's old white frocks and white hats should be altered for Anne Catherick, explaining to her that little girls of her complexion look neater and prettier all in white than in anything else. She hesitated and seemed puzzled for a minute, then flushed up and appeared to understand. Her little hand clasped mine suddenly. She kissed it, Philip, and said, oh, so earnestly, I will always wear white as long as I live. It will help me to remember you, ma'am, and to think that I am pleasing you still, when I go away and see you no more. This is only one specimen of the quaint things she says so prettily. Poor little soul! She shall have a stock of white frocks, made with good deep tucks, to let out for her as she grows. Miss Halcombe paused and looked at me across the piano. Did the forlorn woman whom you met on the high road seem young? she asked. Young enough to be two or three and twenty? Yes, Miss Halcombe, as young as that. And she was strangely dressed from head to foot, all in white? All in white. While the answer was passing my lips, Miss Fairley glided into view on the terrace for the third time. Instead of proceeding on her walk, she stopped, with her back turned towards us, and, leaning on the balustrade of the terrace, looked down into the garden beyond. My eyes fixed on the white gleam of her muslin gown and headdress in the moonlight, and a sensation, for which I can find no name, a sensation that quickened my pulse and raised a fluttering in my heart, began to steal over me. "'All in white,' Miss Halcombe repeated. The most important sentences in the letter, Mr. Hartwright, are those at the end, which I will read to you immediately. But I can't help dwelling a little upon the coincidence of a white costume of the woman you met, and the white frocks which produced that strange answer from my mother's little scholar. The doctor may have been wrong when he discovered the child's defects of intellect, and predicted that she would grow out of them. She may never have grown out of them and the old grateful fancy about dressing in white, which was a serious feeling to the girl, may be a serious feeling to the woman still. I said a few words in answer, I hardly know what. All my attention was concentrated on the white gleam of Miss Fairley's muslin dress. Listen to the last sentences of the letter, said Miss Halcombe. I think they'll surprise you. As she raised the letter to the light of the candle, Miss Fairley turned from the balustrade, looked doubtfully up and down the terrace, advanced a step towards the glass doors, and then stopped facing us. Meanwhile, Miss Halcombe read me the last sentences to which she had referred. And now, my love, seeing that I am at the end of my paper, now for the real reason, the surprising reason, for my fondness for little Anne Catherick. My dear Philip, although she is not half so pretty, she is nevertheless, by one of those extraordinary caprices of accidental resemblance which one sometimes sees, the living likeness in her hair, her complexion, the colour of her eyes, and the shape of her face. I, I started from the Ottoman, before Miss Halcombe could pronounce the next words. A thrill of the same feeling which ran through me, when the touch was laid upon my shoulder on that lonely high road, chilled me again. There stood Miss Fairley, a white figure, alone in the moonlight, 
in her attitude, in the turn of her head, in her complexion, in the shape of her face, the living image, at that distance and under those circumstances, of the woman in white. The doubt which had troubled my mind for hours and hours passed, flashed into conviction in an instant. That something wanting was my own recognition of the luminous likeness between the fugitive from the asylum and my pupil at Limeridge House. "'You see it,' said Miss Halcombe. She dropped the useless letter, and her eyes flashed as they met mine. "'You see it now, as my mother saw it eleven years since.' "'I see it, more unwillingly than I can say, to associate that forlorn, friendless, lost woman, even by an accidental likeness only with Miss Fairley, seems like casting a shadow on the future of the bright creature who stands looking at us now. Let me lose the impression again as soon as possible. Call her in, out of the dreary moonlight. Pray call her in. Mr. Hartwright, you surprise me. Whatever women may be, I thought that men in the nineteenth century were above superstition. Pray call her in. Hush, hush. She's coming of her own accord. Say nothing in her presence. Let this discovery of the likeness be kept a secret between you and me. Come in, Laura, come in, and wake Mrs. Vasey at the piano. Mr. Hartwright is petitioning for some more music, and he wants it this time to be of the lightest and liveliest kind. 9. So ended my eventful first day at Limeridge House. Miss Halcombe and I kept our secret. After the discovery of the likeness, no fresh light seemed destined to break over the mystery of the woman in white. At the first safe opportunity, Miss Halcombe cautiously led her half-sister to speak of her mother. Of old times, of Anne Catherick, Miss Fairley's recollections of the little scholar at Limeridge were, however, only of the vague and general kind. She remembered the likeness between herself and her mother's favourite pupil as something which had been supposed to exist in past times, but she did not refer to the gift of the white dresses, or to the singular form of words in which the child had artlessly expressed her gratitude for them. She remembered that Anne had remained at Limeridge for a few months only, and had then left it to go back to her home in Hampshire, but she could not say whether the mother and daughter had ever returned, or had ever been heard of afterwards. No further search on Miss Halcombe's part through the few letters of Mrs. Fairley's writing, which she had left unread, assisted in clearing up the uncertainties still left to perplex us. We had identified the unhappy woman whom I had met in the night-time with Anne Catherick. We had made some advance, at least, towards connecting the probably defective condition of the poor creature's intellect with the peculiarity of her being dressed all in white, and with the continuance in her maturer years of her childish gratitude towards Mrs. Fairley. And there, so far as we knew at that time, our discoveries had ended. The days passed on, the weeks passed on, and the track of the golden autumn wound its bright way visibly through the green summer of the trees. Peaceful, fast-flowing, happy time. My story glides by you now, as swiftly as you once glided by me. Of all the treasures of enjoyment that you poured so freely into my heart, how much is left me that has purpose and value enough to be written on this page? Nothing but the saddest of all confessions that a man can make, the confession of his own folly. The secret which that confession discloses should be told with little effort, for it has indirectly escaped me already. The poor weak words which have failed to describe Miss Fairley have succeeded in betraying the sensations she awakened in me. It is so with us all. Our words are giants when they do us an injury, and dwarfs when they do us a service. I loved her. Ah! How well I know all the sadness and all the mockery that's contained in those three words! I can sigh over my mournful confession with the tenderest woman who reads it, and pities me. I can laugh at it as bitterly as the hardest man who tosses it from him in contempt. I loved her. Feel for me, or despise me. I confess it with the same immovable resolution, 
to own the truth. Was there no excuse for me? There was some excuse to be found, surely, in the conditions under which my term of hired service was passed at Limeridge House. My morning hours succeeded each other calmly in the quiet and seclusion of my own room. I had just enough work to do in mounting my employer's drawings to keep my hands and eyes pleasurably employed, while my mind was left free to enjoy the dangerous luxury of its own unbridled thoughts. A perilous solitude, for it lasted long enough to enervate, not long enough to fortify me. A perilous solitude, for it was followed by afternoons and evenings, spent day after day and week after week, alone in the society of two women, one of whom possessed all the accomplishments of grace, wit, and high breeding, and the other all the charms of beauty, gentleness, and simple truth that can purify and subdue the heart of man. Not a day passed in that dangerous intimacy of teacher and pupil, in which my hand was not close to Miss Fairley's, my cheek as we bent together over her sketch-book almost touching hers. The more attentively she watched every movement of my brush, the more closely I was breathing the perfume of her hair, and the warm fragrance of her breath. It was part of my service to live in the very light of her eyes. At one time, to be bending over her, so close to her bosom as to tremble at the thought of touching it, at another to feel her bending over me, bending so close to see what I was about, that her voice sank low when she spoke to me, and her ribbons brushed my cheek in the wind before she could draw them back. The evenings which followed the sketching excursions of the afternoon varied rather than checked these innocent, these inevitable familiarities. My natural fondness for the music which she played with such tender feeling, such delicate womanly taste, and her natural enjoyment of giving me back, by the practice of her art, the pleasure which I had offered her by the practice of mine, only wove another tie which drew us closer and closer to one another. The accidents of conversation, the simple habits which regulated even such a little thing as the position of our places at table, the play of Miss Halcombe's ever-ready raillery, always directed against my anxiety as teacher, while it sparkled over her enthusiasm as pupil, the harmless expression of poor Mrs. Vase's drowsy approval, which connected Miss Fairley and me as two model young people who never disturbed her, every one of these trifles and many more, combined to fold us together in the same domestic atmosphere, and to lead us both insensibly to the same hopeless end. I should have remembered my position, and put myself secretly on my guard. I did so, but not till it was too late. All the discretion, all the experience which had availed me with other women, and secured me against other temptations, failed me with her. It had been my profession for years past, to be in this close contact with young girls of all ages, and of all orders of beauty. I had accepted the position as part of my calling in life, and had trained myself to leave all the sympathies natural to my age in my employer's outer hall, as coolly as I left my umbrella there, before I went upstairs. I had long since learnt to understand, composedly, and as a matter of course, that my situation in life was considered a guarantee against any of my female pupils feeling more than the most ordinary interest in me, and that I was admitted among beautiful and captivating women much as a harmless domestic animal is admitted among them. This guardian experience I had gained early. This guardian experience had sternly and strictly guided me straight along my own poor narrow path, without once letting me stray aside, to the right hand or to the left. And now I and my trusty talisman were parted for the first time. Yes, my hardly earned self-control was as completely lost to me as if I had never possessed it. Lost to me, as it is lost every day to other men, in other critical situations where women are concerned. I know now that I should have questioned myself from the first. I should have asked why any room in the house was better than home to me when she entered it, and barren as a desert when she went out again. Why I always noticed and remembered the little changes in her dress that I had noticed and remembered in no other woman's before why I saw her, heard her, and touched her, 
when we shook hands at night and morning, as I had never seen, heard, and touched any other woman in my life. I should have looked into my own heart, and found this new growth springing there, and plucked it out while it was young. Why was this easiest, simplest work of self-culture always too much for me? The explanation has been written already in the three words that were many enough and plain enough for my confession. I loved her. The days passed. The weeks passed. It was approaching the third month of my stay in Cumberland. The delicious monotony of life in our calm seclusion flowed on with me, like a smooth stream with a swimmer who glides down the current. All memory of the past, all thought of the future, all sense of the falseness and hopelessness of my own position, lay hushed within me into deceitful rest, lulled by the siren song that my own heart sung to me, with eyes shut to all sight and ears closed to all sound of danger, I drifted nearer and nearer to the fatal rocks. The warning that aroused me at last and startled me into sudden, self-accusing consciousness of my own weakness was the plainest, the truest, the kindest of all warnings, for it came silently from her. We had parted one night as usual. No word had fallen from my lips at that time or any time before it that could betray me or startle her into sudden knowledge of the truth. But when we met again in the morning a change had come over her, a change that told me all. I shrank then. I shrink still from invading the innermost sanctuary of her heart and laying it open to others, as I have laid open my own. Let it be enough to say the time when she first surprised my secret was, I firmly believe, the time when she first surprised her own, and the time also when she changed towards me in the interval of one night. Her nature, too truthful to deceive others, was too noble to deceive itself. When the doubt that I had hushed to sleep first laid its weary weight on her heart, the true face owned all and said in its own frank, simple language, I'm sorry for him. I'm sorry for myself. It said this, and more, which I could not then interpret. I understood but too well the change in her manner, to greater kindness and quicker readiness in interpreting all my wishes before others, to constraint and sadness, and nervous anxiety, to absorb herself in the first occupation she could seize on, whenever we happened to be left together alone. I understood why the sweet, sensitive lips smiled so rarely and so restrainedly now, and why the clear blue eyes looked at me, sometimes with the pity of an angel, sometimes with the innocent perplexity of a child. But the change meant more than this. There was a coldness in her hand. There was an unnatural immobility in her face. There was in all her movements the mute expression of constant fear and clinging self-reproach. The sensations that I could trace to herself and to me, the unacknowledged sensations that we were feeling in common, were not these. There were certain elements of the change in her that were still secretly drawing us together, and others that were as secretly beginning to drive us apart. In my doubt and perplexity, in my vague suspicion of something hidden, which I was left to find by my own unaided efforts, I examined Miss Halcombe's looks and manner for enlightenment. Living in such intimacy as ours, no serious alteration could take place in any one of us, which did not sympathetically affect the others. The change in Miss Fairley was reflected in her half-sister. Although not a word escaped Miss Halcombe which hinted at an altered state of feeling towards myself, her penetrating eyes had contracted a new habit of always watching me. Sometimes the look was like suppressed anger, sometimes like suppressed dread, sometimes like neither, like nothing, in short, which I could understand. A week elapsed, leaving us all three still in this position of secret constraint towards one another. My situation, aggravated by the sense of my own miserable weakness and forgetfulness of myself, now too late awakened in me, was becoming intolerable. 
I felt that I must cast off the oppression under which I was living, at once and for ever, and yet how to act for the best, or what to say first, was more than I could tell. From this position of helplessness and humiliation I was rescued by Miss Halcombe. Her lips told me the bitter, the necessary, the unexpected truth. Her hearty kindness sustained me under the shock of hearing it. Her sense and courage turned to its right use an event which threatened the worst that could happen to me and to others in Limeridge House. End of track three.